As Germany reels from its worst energy crisis, its chancellor tours Gulf countries in search of alternatives. But can they ensure secure energy for Germany and Europe? And how is gas shaping the politics of the region during the war in Ukraine? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is in the Gulf hoping to secure new partnerships with oil and gas rich nations. He met leaders of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar, hoping to agree on how to meet the nation's energy needs since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, since the war, EU countries have had to cut back on energy and look for supplies elsewhere. Germany's economy is already on the verge of a recession amid soaring prices and the prospect of a tough winter ahead. We've made progress on a whole series of projects that now concern the production of diesel gas. We have LNG projects that play a role here and, of course, also many things that have to do with modernization with IT projects. So this is very important for future economic cooperation, but, of course, also for the transformation of national economies that are moving towards climate neutrality. And now, of course, very relevant for the issues of energy security. In this context, it was an important visit and a good opportunity to continue good relations. But well, the EU is facing a major shortage of energy. Before the war in Ukraine, Russia supplied 40% of the bloc's natural gas and more than a quarter of its imported oil. Germany is among the hardest hit countries, previously importing more than half of its gas from Russia. France has access to other terminals and the UK have no direct pipelines to Russia. Combined, they consume less than 21% of Moscow's supplied energy. Well, let's bring in our guests now to talk more about this. Joining us by Skype from Berlin is Ulrich Breutner. He is Professor of Political Science at Stanford University in Berlin. Also by Skype from Doha, Mahjoub Zawairi, Director of the Gulf Studies Center at Qatar University. And Andreas Goldau is Professor at the Willy Brandt School of Public Policy. He joins us from Berlin uh, as well. Good to have you all uh, with us, gentlemen. Ulrich Breutner. So, Olaf Scholz is coming to the Gulf looking for these new energy deals. Why now? Well, it serves a number of purposes. It's on the one hand a signal to the German public that the government is frantically trying everything possible to address the problems that we are facing before a winter that can be long, can be hard, but it's definitely full of question marks how hard we will be hit and what to do with it. So it sends a signal that he's collecting opportunities to reduce the dependency from Russia. It will certainly not lead to the one replacement of a dependency by another, but it's a step in the direction of, on the one hand, he returns home with new contracts. And on the other hand, this is the beginning of a new foreign policy of Germany and the European Union. Andreas Golter, how does this trip address Germany's energy needs, particularly with that, with that rough winter uh, approaching now? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I guess um, what we're looking at here essentially is a dire situation. As Oli just said, I mean, the Europeans just lost essentially 150 billion cubic meters of gas a year, uh, and that's a lasting loss. Russia's not going to come back anytime soon. A lot of LNG essentially came in to replace uh, the molecules that have been lost from Russia, and Qatar has been playing an important role here. Now, Germany hopes uh, to get a, a share out of the expanding production in Qatar, uh, notably the North Field, which comes online around 25, 26, 27. And uh, although this lies in the future, uh, it will be important for Germany and Europe to secure part of that, simply because the Russian molecules are not going to come back. So a lot of what Schultz is trying to do at the moment is forward-looking policy. It's certainly not about the upcoming winter and striking a deal for that. And Mahjoub Zawairi, what do the Gulf countries get out of this? The United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, obviously, they're going to get more business uh, and they're going to get to sell more energy. But beyond that, 
in terms of the, of, of, of the geopolitics, what do they gain from this? You know, Hazim, there is a very interesting uh, debate going on now about um, what's happening between Europe, or Germany, or other countries, and uh, Gulf states. Um, the nature of the debate basically is very interesting because what those leaders, uh, whether Biden or uh, Macron or now the um, German, um, uh, 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 um, uh, basically, uh, is hearing from from the capitals that two two kind of debate. One says, you know, um, by the way, you know, your relation was not developing with us, uh, and there is a history of differences. And there is another debate. Uh, says we welcome future relations, and I think this dominate the debate. Why I'm why I'm focusing on this just in a quick a quick uh, in, intro, because I think this will uh, uh, for will shape the the kind of relations we witness and will 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 tell us who are the main countries of the Gulf will be in, involved in this uh, energy collaboration. What we are seeing now, that there is more focus on, on Qatar in particular, because of LNG. Um, uh, what we are hearing from uh, Europeans and the Americans, that they are not getting uh, a very clear messages. That is the, 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 the minimum I can describe. A very clear message from Riyadh and Abu Dhabi about their, 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 their share of help. And that, that takes us to another level, which is what's happening in terms of politics and how those countries are actually looking to their to define their all their role in near future it's it's obvious that any investment on energy sector coming from the gulf needs the contribution of the uh, uh, targeted country this including germany the united states france or all of them they need to be involved on a lot of uh, preparations and i think uh, what the the three countries are trying to deliver to the uh, uh, european partners what is your share? What will be your contribution? And you have to, mean, to keep in mind the message from those countries. You have to keep in mind that we have an old partners like China, like Japan, and we cannot basically give up on those people. So you, we, you need to respect our relations with other partners and you need to collaborate with us so we can help you. Yeah, um, Ulrich Breukner, um, if I could turn to you on, on, on some of that. Um, as far as uh, Germany's relations with these uh, uh, Gulf nations, w w what's at stake for them with regard to uh, the war in Ukraine and, and the political implications of that? Well, the war in Ukraine is seen as a watershed, a new situation in geopolitics, and we are waiting to see in what direction things are moving. So the situation since 2016, when the European Union didn't have direct relations with the Gulf Cooperation Council countries on a ministerial level to just wait what is happening there and leave it to other international players to have an influence in the Gulf, as what has just been said, that the relationship with China is considered to be much closer than with the European Union. This is something the European Union and Germany as the biggest country in the EU cannot afford to allow to stay in the like this in the future. So it's not just about energy, it's about security, it's about migration, it's about what's the situation in the Balkans and in Northern Africa, in which all these countries play an important role. And therefore, Germany and the EU is reaching out to build a broader and more comprehensive approach in the relationship with the countries in the region. Andreas Gotha, how does Germany's energy situation compare with the rest uh, of Europe with this, with this winter approaching now and, and the need to kind of diversify their, their energy uh, supplies? Is, is there a sense that Germany kind of got in there first? Well, look, I think um, it's important to acknowledge that, uh, well, things have been improved quite a bit and quite fast, in fact. Uh, I mean, it is remarkable how quickly the Russian gas has been replaced by LNG imports. And uh, on top of that, there have been a lot of uh, you know, ways in which a fuel switch happened from gas to other fuels, including, including coal, but also oil when it comes to industrial production. And on top of that, you got savings. Industry demand is down, for instance, and we're seeing the impact on households as well. Uh, so if you add that, plus gas storage, which has been filled up to the maximum level by now, uh, or at least according to Target by now, this 
gives us a reassuring situation for our outlook for the winter. Uh, but I think it's also important uh, to acknowledge the fact that Germany is part of a European energy system. This is not only about German imports, it's European imports. And Germany does not necessarily import LNG, it imports LNG through, say, Belgium or the Netherlands. And wouldn't it, for those LNG import terminals, the Germans wouldn't have any gas? And so this, it is important to acknowledge that uh, it is not only about one country, it's, it's about an integrated system where storage plays a role not only for one country, but for various countries. And, uh, and I think here, the, the efforts of the European integration, and particularly the integration of the European energy market for the last 20, 25 years, they have been really paying off. Mahjoub Zawari, um, the issue of human rights is something that, that, um, that's come up uh, in, in this trip. Uh, we're not sure how much these discussions uh, there were discussions about this that took place between Olaf Schultz and the, and the various leaders. But if you look at Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, um, who was, you know, persona non grata up until uh, the beginning of this uh, year because of the, the murder of the, uh, the Saudi journalist uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Is there a sense he's, he's, he's sort of coming, coming in from the cold now, that the, the, the reality... Uh, of, of politics are set in now for many Western nations? Um, no doubt, has a, politics has changed. Um, I mean, this starts with Biden, and now it, it moves to uh, most of the um, EU capitals. Um, I think uh, those capitals, they felt the heat. And um, one of the issues, they cannot uh, ignore the fact that they, they have to stop lecturing people, um, whether you agree or not. Uh, they were lecturing people about human rights. Uh, they were lecturing people about plan Bs of governance. Um, however, they failed for uh, the first crisis when it comes to the energy. I mean, you look you look at what happened in, in decent since, uh, since February, uh, and you look at the panic uh, uh, EU has. Uh, this will create a lot of doubts about the plan Bs that uh, EU used to lecture the world about them and the good governance and, and, and how to manage the crisis. And I think also this applies to the human rights issue and how much they are actually they are uh, um, decisive and they are honest when it comes to this. Uh, not only actually human rights is, is one item. Look at the energy transition. Uh, uh, Europe used to lecture the world about energy transition and going to clean energy. Um, however, when they felt the heat, they had to go to use the uh, uh, nuclear energy and then stop uh, and deactivate a lot of uh, uh, nuclear sites. This is this is a moral a moral question. This crisis basically uh, is raising a moral question about uh, what the EU used to lecture the world about and how much they are sincere and and how much they are actually fulfilling their commitment when it comes to human rights and defending the human rights and actually uh, trying to. Uh, uh, defend those who are uh, oppressed or those who suffer. I think uh, these are another uh, uh, round of, of, of uh, uh, assessment uh, to all of these uh, values that EU and the American, they used to sell uh, the people in the region. Ulrich Breutner, what's your take on that? I mean, critics will say that uh, uh, concerns about any concerns uh, that uh, Germany would have about uh, human rights uh, in, in the Gulf region would be put to one side now because of, of Germany's energy needs? Well, it's not as hypocritical as it sounds. If there are fundamental human rights violations, Germany and the European Union will stand up and call them fundamental human rights violations. What I think is beneficial, not only in this dialogue that we have seen in the making since the start of the, the war in Ukraine, but also what is happening before the World Cup in Qatar in football is that there's a growing attention to what is actually happening in societies in the region. And so far, all you could read in Western media is they violate human rights and they waste energy. And now we get a much more differentiated picture and developments like what's the role of women in countries like Saudi Arabia needs to be evaluated more clearly and more closely. It's not about lecturing. If there are violations of human rights, then those whose rights have been violated should count on the European Union that they stand up and call it this. Uh, Mahjoub, your response to that? You're shaking your head there. Um, I am insisting on lecturing. 
um, are lecturing because this is what was happening. I mean, um, the world was lecturing Qatar about human rights um, since the World Cup um, was given to be organized here. Um, but they are they are ignoring the fact that uh, they supported uh, Germany to have the World Cup when Hitler was in power. Uh, and they ignore the fact that the city of business in, 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 in Paris were built by immigrants and, and people who are still suffered because of illness and 50,000 people will die until 2050. They ignore all of this. They are selective. They are lecturing. And they want, they, when, they want, uh, when they want energy, they will put the human rights aside. And I know per personally that they have the tools to do so. They have the rule to change who are playing the game. Sometimes the governments come and speak. Ministers can come. The president can come. However, regardless who's this, you know, important, and then they give it to the media, and they say we are in free media. Free media can do everything. If the if the free media can hold them accountable, they will go to the civil society. They play different cards, but they are not honest, and they are lecturing the world about something they know that they should be. Uh, uh, um, uh, fair and look at uh, the suffering of other people. <clears throat> um, Andreas Scotta, uh, if I could bring the, the, the issue of, of, of energy and Germany's energy needs back to this. Uh, Germany does plan to be carbon neutral by 2045. They've they made that very clear. How does this, uh, these deals now with, with the Gulf countries affect their plans? Yeah, look, um, let me also echo Oli, first of all, I have to, I have to say this. I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether that hypocrisy really is one as described. And uh, I, would, um, I would also challenge the notion of, of different times and regimes being similar to the, uh, to the present situation and actually comparable. But um, coming back to, to, the, to the German question uh, and, and where they go with their energy transition, and I think that ties also a little bit into, into what my pre uh, predecessor said about uh, whether the Germans and the Europeans are hypocritical in, when it comes to their energy transition, I don't think there actually is any, cha any change of tack. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment is, is various governments in Europe trying to plug holes uh, because of the, the Russia situation and the Ukraine war. But at the same time, there's massive investments going on that, um, that accelerate the, the energy transition. Um, the Repower EU plan put forward 290 billion just for renewables. The Germans are investing 200 billion in industrial decarbonization. Uh, there are plans to essentially turn the North Sea into a green power plant. And uh, we're talking about 100 gigawatts of, of capacity. Just by comparison, that's 75 nuclear power plants of capacity. So what, what we're looking at here is essentially a, an energy transition on steroids, if you will, and driven by Putin and an aggressive war, not necessarily by climate policy. That's the irony of it. So what I'm thinking, and if we connect the dots here and if we do the numbers, we might actually get well ahead of our 20, 20, 35 targets when it comes to renewables and decarbonization. And I'm absolutely convinced that, uh, that the goal of uh, net zero by 45 will be kept no matter what. Um, Ulrich Breukner, is it fair to say, uh, you know, six, seven months ago, Olaf Scholz would, would not have been even considering a, a, a trip like this, the, the, the kind of, um, the, the, the urgent needs of, of, of uh, supplying, supplying Germany's uh, energy needs is, 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 is what drove him to do this. I'm not so sure about it, because what he said at the beginning of the term of the new coalition is that Germany will be a different country at the end of the term. And what Andreas just pointed out is that the war in Ukraine is a boost for the transition to turn the German economy into a fossil free economy. And you need partners for this. And it's not just a replacement of energy sources, it also comes with technology. So if Germany as an export based economy can export solutions that matter in other parts of the world or that come as an incentive to compare the different interests then it makes perfect sense to reach out for countries that, for example, are very rich with sunshine and not are very far away. And you can think of giant pipeline projects to produce blue um, um, energy resources that would make sense in um, differently composed energy mix in Europe. Uh, Mahjoub, if we 
talk about um, the, the war in Ukraine uh, right now and where, where the, the Middle Eastern countries, particularly Gulf countries, stand on that. They're, they're having to, to kind of strike a balance here, aren't they, because of, of their uh, ties with, with China and Russia? I think it's obvious that Gulf states um, uh, are, try, are trying to be balanced on their position because at the end of the day, this war is happening in Europe. However, the ramification is getting to their capitals because they are, um, uh, you know, controlling 65 of energy with oil and gas. And so basically, uh, they try to be balanced because they have ties with the West, including EU. They have ties with, uh, with China uh, and they don't want to upset Russia. It's obvious. Um, uh, and I think this kind of balance, um, it, it's really tough a process because, um, you know, uh, you know that um, EU and, and the West and, and the United States are, are, are determined uh, to basically put uh, Russia under pressure. Um, and the, the, I think the narrative from the Gulf is very clear. We are trying to help to, have, to secure um, energy resources as part of our uh, global responsibility. That is that is Will Pot's statement that you know Gulf State is is helping on securing the energy resources, contributing to the energy resources to those societies who are suffering as a consequence. And this, you know, I think there is a consistency on some on this, especially when it comes to countries like Qatar. They say, you know, we are helping those countries who are in need in other, and and those countries they are want to to buy our uh, gas. We are ready to sell it. However, they need to contribute to building infrastructure and um, etc. So I think it's very it's very clear that uh, attempt to have a, to have a clear balance um, in a very tough time uh, and that and and the problem is the nature of the crisis is still is not clear where it moves and whether it it it, it will be escalated or there will be more actually of this and it will be uh, it will have more impact on energy security uh, uh, in the globe as a whole. Yeah, let's get uh, Andreas's uh, take on this. W what implications does this have then for global energy security as a whole then? Well, the crisis is such at the moment it does a couple of things to the global energy system. Uh, first of all, it puts a strain on already very tight LNG markets and those LNG markets in terms of supply, they move sideways for the next one or two years or maybe three years until Situations change again in the US and in Qatar. Um, that means additional supplies. But there is also a big shift in oil because uh, the Europeans are embargoing Russian oil. Uh, there is uh, a G7 embargo on Russian oil, including a price cap. And not all of that will be redelivered and, and redirected uh, to other world regions, which means you will take some off the market. And that will probably have an impact uh, on uh, on the market as well. We also have uh, a similar situation with coal. Uh, coal got sanctioned by August this year by the EU, Russian coal that is, and, and that also meant markets got even more tight than they were. Now, the one thing that is important to see is that uh, whilst we're talking about the Gulf and, and Europe at the moment, this in fact has an implication and an impact mainly on non-OECD countries in the global south, that is Southeast Asia, Africa, and elsewhere, because that's where people feel high prices the most. Uh, those are economies that are in part LNG import dependent, like uh, Pakistan, which is hardly hit Bangladesh, and, and other parts which are now priced out of the market, or they have um, very high, high oil intensities in, uh, of their economy, which means the moment prices go north, those economies are hit hard. So the repercussions uh, are mostly felt in places that are poor, not rich. All right, uh, we are going to have to leave it there. Uh, thanks very much to uh, all three of you. Ulrich Breukner in Berlin, Mahjoub Zawery in Doha, and uh, Andreas Goltau joining us from Berlin as well. Thanks very much for being on Inside Story. And that is it for our show. Thank you as well for watching. Remember, you can see the program again anytime. Just go to our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Seeker, and the whole team here, bye for now.